of you for coming. Uh, it's so nice to see you. Uh, so Light Light developed out of what was to me a surprising and pressing interest in 18th and 19th century botany. Um, it came to me suddenly. Um, but what I was, so in the 18th and 19th centuries, there developed a global culture of botany. And what I was struck with in reading about this was how cultivating plants, transporting plants, writing about plants, thinking about plants, um, shaped discourses of knowing and um, technological innovations and colonialism and industrialization and concepts of humanness. And these are also things that I was struck by um, are incredibly relevant to us today. Um, so that's just a little bit of framework. I'm, I'm going to read from um, a series of the poems. They're longer with discrete sections. Um, and so I'm, I guess I'll be reading one possible thread through the book. Uh, yeah. Ghost Species. Henry David Thoreau would describe the seasons listing the flowering times of wildflowers around Concord, Massachusetts, 1851 to 1858. It continues today, the data, the occasional field, the wildflowers declining. Temperatures warm and surviving species flower now about seven days earlier than they did in the mid 19th century. Species sensitive to temperature have been best able to survive, best able perhaps to maintain synchronicity with other plants, pollin pollinators, and predators. The ghostliness of seasonal change, an orchid coming to flower overnight. Species unresponsive to temperature have decreased in abundance. Lapsing species becoming, for a moment, ghosts. Place faithful, they persist after the ending of their environments. Exiled in stillness, then, in a moment, slipping out of life. Objects and gestures extend to become signs, and signs become an alphabet. We learned words from wildflowers declining in the field. Anemones and buttercups, asters, campanulas, goldenrods, pussy toes and thistles, bedstraws and bluets, bladder, bladderworts, dogwoods, lilies, louseworts, and Indian paintbrushes, mints, orchids, primroses, roses, saxifrage, Indian pipes, St. John's warts, and violets. We read flowering times from a countryside map sewn by hand. The then and now, the never to come, will have been, uh, oh, will have been flowering and the species slipped from the sun. The fax was broken, the internet too abstract. We sent messages by radio, telegraph, pigeon, balloon. The flowers stop, the flowers stop. The advancing march of spring flowering stop. We couldn't forget the careful catalogs from the 1850s or the disappearance of several fields of sight. If you came from the field born like grass in the hutch of sun that held cloud and no rain, that waited rain in the antechamber of your mountain, a small hill bearing weather with the reserve of a regiment newly outfitted, but seasoned nonetheless by early scraps and first uncertain days. If in the morning you woke in the field and then hammered a bird skull white as surrender to a nearby birch giving vision texture, the bone whites extending into the plane of sight and st straight through that to the hold of touch. If it began with perception and will end with perception and you hold me close when it breaks, close enough to hear the cracking but not to feel its vibration, when you, eating birch bark, carrying, 
carrying me on your back, Swedish, licking the trees, melt snow in your mouth and feed me. You may see a horse among rocks, see it unsaddle the field. The mind is a mood of electricity, warmth, water, and wind. We trace an economy of light, mobilize distance. The sky, as we watch it drift and come apart, gives no sense of itself before. We follow the trade routes, investigate the flora and fauna of the vice royalty, tarry along the imperial frontier, chart coastlines. We draft maps, particularly of lesser known and contested areas, and conduct astronomical observations and measurements. We read about the politics. Attending to angles of dissidence that extend beyond the measurement of cloud ceilings and temperatures. We paint atomic cartographies using pigments formed from Akio, Dahlia, Saffron, Indigo, and Lichens. At a great remove becomes a way of tracing atmospheric exchange between continents and oceans, between evolution and fallout. The aerial movement of geopolitical forces reflects the distance clouds cover, past sea blooms and oozy woods. Persistent sky watching, the whale shapes a cloud makes, the lion beside it. By what laws does a body dissolve, leaving behind nothing but a negative, a radiation shadow? A little wind, an unseasonable cloud, crosses a field. A filament of light, an ecology of intensities. Chlorophyll confers the faculty of feeding on light. Hair breadths of light dangle deliciously, open resilient margins of attention. The minuscule trembles. Absorption and loss are labor. This is a tacit intimacy, an, in an energetic discordance of vibrating cells. The sun hangs before color, energy tied up. The light burning in my hand. This takes nothing away. The apricot still on the cart, trembling in the sun. Pollen spun, it buds to branch. If you cut out my abdomen like the bees, and if I drink with the tongue, Mouth theft, throat theft. Nectar falls from the body and tapers as gentle as, tapers as quiet as, tapers into cups of parceled light, the bee beside itself, dripping. Neither mandible nor rib, neither sternum nor wrist, neither wing nor... And this is the final poem. The Lighthouse Revolving. Yesterday, late afternoon light fell at an angle incoherent with my thought, and I knew nothing well. This morning there was little light, and knowing seemed silly, the decadence of dismissible chance. Now I know enough to feel that sensing the mind's dissolution and calling it perception is possibly dangerous, requires a body and mind and soul and voice and pollen and vegetative dens density that have the freedom to dissolve to become what is glimpsed from the corner of an eye, however briefly, or a felt absence, in lightning flashes to escape the laws of the world, these flashes lightening us. Thank you.